man has turned to the sea into the life above and below it for adventure. Not content with surface thrills, man also invades the depths equipped with a diving hat, weight boots, dive suit, endless courage and curiosity as he moves into this airless fluid world. Join us as we explore the depths on this episode of Diving Into the Past. Hello, and welcome to Diving Into the Past, presented by Kirby Morgan and the Historical Diving Society USA. In this episode, we're going to visit one of the more plentiful authentic helmets that are available to collectors. It is also one of the more economical helmets to acquire, and it comes with a great deal of diving history. These two are Russian Soviet Navy three-bolt helmets with the carrying handles on the top, and they can now be found in collections around the world. These helmets were built in Russia towards the end of last century, and as the Soviet Union began to slowly collapse, these helmets and other Russian diving equipment and other Russian military equipment gradually began to filter out into the world marketplace. The obvious difference between these helmets and the previous styles we have shown is that the waterproof seal between the helmet and the diver's dress is made at the neck ring and not at the outer edge of the breastplate. The diver dresses in through the neck of the dress but the breastplate attaches to the dress by the three bolts on the neck ring. This three bolt system is much different from Augustus Seabee's design, which used 12 bolts and four brass brails to attach the breastplate to the dress. The 12 wing nuts and four brass brails of the Augustus Seabee design are now replaced with just three large nuts. These three bolt helmets are popular with international classic diving equipment groups, as the helmet, dress, boots, weights, knife and other accessories are all fairly easy to acquire from the various internet sites that sell surplus Soviet military equipment. In addition to the actual diving equipment, there are several other related items available, such as these Russian military diver badges and pins. Most of the earlier ones are made of brass and are quite detailed, as can be seen here. In the year 2000, I published an article on the 100th anniversary of the Russian Navy Diving School at Kronstadt, which took place in 1982. It was translated from the original Russian text and was the cover story of the winter 2000 issue of the HCS USA magazine, Historical Diver. Two years later, in 2002, HDS Russia started publishing their own magazine on Russian diving history which also had an English text. HDS Russia had been founded by my friend Alexander Sledkov. In 2002, HDS USA Chairman Lee Selisky sponsored Alexander to come to California and present a paper on Russian deep diving achievements at the HDS USA 10th Anniversary Conference. Alexander presented some very important information dealing how advanced the Soviet mixed gas programs were around the World War II period. We published this information in issue 35 of Historical Diver magazine. All the magazines shown here are available from the HDS USA by emailing info at hds.org. In addition to these magazines, anybody interested in this Russian equipment and the history of Russian diving should try to find a copy of Pavel Borovikov's book, The Illustrated History of Russian Diving. It is an excellent book with both English and Russian texts and deserves a place in any diving history library. But back to these three bolt helmets. These started to become available in large numbers in the USA in the early 1990s and the story of how they got here deserves to be recorded. One of my closest friends was the famed commercial diver Torrance Parker who founded Parker Diving Services and who will be familiar internationally for the two books that he authored, 20,000 Jobs Under the Sea and 20,000 Divers Under the Sea. In the early 1990s, Torrance telephoned me and asked me to come to Los Angeles to meet the two retired US Navy captains, Don Keach and Don Walsh, who he had sold Parker Diving Services to. These two Navy captains were known in the industry as the two Dons, and both had piloted Picard's deep diving submersible, Trieste, on dives that were truly historic. 
Lawrence said that they would like my opinion on some diving equipment they had acquired and he thought I might be able to assist them. I drove to Los Angeles and stayed overnight with Torrance, which I often did. The next day, he took me to the Parker Diving Services office to meet the two Dons and discuss their equipment. I was very surprised to learn that this equipment was a large inventory of new Soviet Navy three-bolt helmets, and they explained how they had come to acquire them. From that meeting, I struck up a friendship with both of the Dons, but had more contact with Don Walsh through my friendship with Torrance and also through my friendship with Andy Rechnitzer and the Deep Submergence Pilots Association, of which both Dons were members. It is now around 30 years since we had that meeting in Los Angeles, and sadly both Don Keach and Torrance have passed away. But my friend Don Walsh is still very much with us, and here he is to tell you about how this large group of Soviet Navy three-bolt helmets came into America. Hello, my name is Don Walsh, and I've been asked to uh, uh, give a little bit of the history of the three-bolt Russian helmets that uh, my company imported in the United States in the late 1980s. In 1983, my business partner Don Keach and I bought Parker Diving Company from Torrance Parker, its founder. PDS uh, is located in the LA Long Beach Harbor, so a lot of our work was involved with ships. And we made a good living, for example, doing uh, surveys, change of ownership surveys, uh, class surveys, um, and hull cleaning. Now, at this time, the Soviet Union, um, the companies operating with Morflot, which was our Ministry of Marine, Merchant Marine, uh, there was no good accounting system as to what things cost. Therefore, you could sort of drive your ship up to a dock and fill up with fuel and nobody sent you a bill. Uh, I exaggerate a bit, but, that, but not by much. And um, so the whole idea of doing surveys, underwater surveys, hull surveys of ships was simplified in their view. They would simply dry dock the ship. Well, most of us in the shipping world or in the maritime world know that there's not a good cost comparison, a favorable one between dry docking a ship to inspect it and using properly trained divers to underwater do underwater inspections and hull cleaning, things like that. When President Gorbachev, the last president of the Soviet Union, came into his office, he proposed that um, that all state companies would earn as le at least as much money as they cost the state. That seemed rather, rather reasonable to us in the West uh, in that uh, you shouldn't operate at a, at a negative profit, if you will. Uh, but for Russian companies, the Soviet companies, I should say, it uh, was pretty radical. Well, one thing and another, they decided, they, they had heard about, uh, in Morflot, about the capability of doing a lot of work on ships using divers, properly trained divers who knew ship nomenclature and had some history of uh, doing that work successfully. So uh, they sent a, a, a group, uh, perhaps one or two people, around to the various harbor departments in the major ports in the United States. And when they got to Los Angeles port, they asked their questions about what can be done, who knows how to do this, and so on. And they simply told this delegation from Morflot go see Parker Diving, because we were just down the road on the waterfront in San Pedro. And so they came to our, our offices and talked to us. We said, sure, it's, you know, this has been going a long time. It's, it's, it's understood these inspections, the, the validity of these inspections uh, has long been recognized by the class societies and owners, Coast Guard, and so on. So uh, you know, it's just standard procedure for us. And they thought that was pretty neat. And one thing and another, uh, I don't know how we backed into this, we ended up forming a, uh, a joint venture in 1989 uh, with uh, some people from Morflot, uh, and we called it Soyuz, which was, means together, uh, you know, partnership. Soyuz Marine Services, located in Murmansk, a major northern port. In fact, the only ice free port in Russia year round. Now, uh, 
once we got to Murmansk and looked over the, the situation, we were able to uh, find space for our dive shop. And we, of course, had Russian partners. Our side owned 51% of this joint venture. And by the way, it was one of the first joint ventures with, uh, with the Soviet Union. This is back towards the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, in, as I said earlier, 1989, that was the time of Perestroika uh, and Glasnost, which uh, Gorbachev had, uh, had instigated. We uh, set up there, we, we provided know-how and we provided some equipment like underwater uh, color TV system, things like that, that helped get them started. Now, uh, over the years, uh, we uh, didn't get that much work. I mean, it, wasn't, it was certainly no profit center for Parker Diving, but it was a pretty interesting operation and certainly uh, unique uh, for having an American company in there because there weren't that many joint venture companies at all between uh, U.S. Uh, uh, organizations and uh, Soviet companies, groups. But one thing that we did, uh, we were always looking for other opportunities in the Soviet Union because uh, the, the diving business didn't seem to take off as much as we thought, even though uh, Morflot was massive and they had uh, major ship uh, operations out of uh, several ports throughout the Soviet Union. We figured we'd expand from Murmansk and out in that direction as we developed the capabilities and the trained personnel. We were not going to use our own people. We would train the Russian divers on how to do this work, supervise them, and as I said earlier, uh, provide the basic equipment, at least the starting equipment. So we were, in, we were not out too much in the way of money, but we, uh, we had a lot of ambition. Well, among the things that came our way was the possibility of acquiring a lot of brand new Russian Soviet diving equipment. And so uh, we had a look at that. And one thing that attracted us uh, was the availability of a large quantity of these Russian three bolt helmets. And, and, I, and here, here I offer a caution. Don Keach and I were not uh, from the diving community and we're Norway helmet collectors. So bear with me if I uh, use the wrong nom nomenclature. We did operate a commercial diving company, but in fact, we were not uh, commercial trained divers. We'd both gone through the Navy underwater swimmer school, which was basically scuba. Uh, which was required for our work when we were both in the Navy. We we're both retired captains. And so uh, we thought, well, let's see if we can bring some of those into the United States. And it wasn't easy, uh, but we did get them out of the uh, supply uh, system at uh, Murmansk. They were uh, unused, brand new. Uh, and what interested me, uh, and maybe those of you that are collectors uh, understand all of this, is that they were handmade. They were, you could see the peening marks where apparently they had put the uh, metal into some kind of uh, mold and then basically peened around the inside to shape the, the shape of the helmet that we all know instead of spinning them on let's say on a mandrel uh, which is I think pretty standard for uh, later production of hard hats like the Mark V's and such. So they, they were in fact we were told that the company that uh, built these helmets, uh, the state company that built these helmets, was uh, in Tsarist times, it, it started up, and it was called the St. Petersburg Naval Brass Factory. St. Petersburg was the name of the city there, and it is again today. At the time we were doing our work there, it was still Leningrad. And uh, we, uh, we were successful in, in getting, uh, I and, believe it was on the order of 80 to 100 of these brand new, Soviet three bolt helmets. We uh, gradually imported the United States. They're hard to export from Soviet Union, as you can guess, because they were considered a property of the state. Uh, and we got around that. And then uh, when they brought them to the United States, uh, our uh, Customs Immigration Service was quite interested in what were we bringing in. And that wasn't easy. We had to jump through a few hoops on that. And Ultimately, we had to label every one of them uh, for display only, not for diving. I don't know why they specified that, uh, but uh, there it is. And then we, uh, Don and I learned a, a quick lesson. These diving helmets are a commodity. Uh, yes, the rare ones, ones and twos, not a problem. You bring in a bunch of them and the market 
really can't absorb that much. And so prices are going to really collapse um, if indeed anybody wants to buy uh, large numbers of these things. So what we ended up doing was uh, basically handing them over to intermediaries, uh, you know, people who were brokers, if you will, who uh, traded in uh, helmets, diving helmets and equipment. And because they could afford to buy them uh, and then just sit on them and gradually sort of meter them out into the market to keep the value up. We weren't too interested in that. We just wanted to uh, improve our bottom line. So I don't know what we, I think we paid maybe $80 uh, a helmet, which was a damn good price. Even not being collectors, we, we could understand that. And I, you know, we bumped that up with a fair uh, markup for ourselves, and then we just offloaded them to uh, uh, various uh, uh, brokers and such that who could sit on them, as I said, and eventually release them into the market. Don and I used to laugh and call our adventures in the Soviet Union gullible's travels because uh, we were learning something every every day. It seemed like, but it didn't cost us much. We were ultimately out a few thousand dollars, but boy, did we have stories to dine out on. And by the way, we not only, in addition to the helmets, and this wasn't a very big add-on to the business, we brought in divers' knives. Uh, we even, I think, brought in a couple of swimmer uh, assist vehicles, like, like the recreational ones where you lie down on it and it takes you around underwater, battery-powered. Uh, some small stuff like that, but nothing ever went anywhere uh, in, in that area, the, the other equipment. The, it was the three bolt helmets that were really the the big item for us and we did okay the two dons later gave one of the two helmets shown here to their friend lad haddleman who was a co-founder of oceaneering international lad had the helmet on display in the foyer of his house when he sadly passed away in 2020 the helmet maintained its connections to deep diving submersibles when it was acquired by his good friend patrick Leahy. patrick owns triton submersibles and has been making history with retired U.S. Navy Commander Victor Vescovo and their five deep expedition dives to the deepest parts of the world's oceans. In early 2022, Captain Don Walsh personally presented the Captain Don Walsh Award for Ocean Exploration to Patrick and Victor in London at Oceanology International. A quick internet search of their names will give accountings of their important historic adventures.